the unspeakable gift of Christmas. I think uh, normally we do our Bible studies on Wednesday night, doing you know, Sunday school on Wednesday night is definitely a little odd, but I'd, I'd say we all have a few words that we can say about Christmas, things that we, uh, we understand, recognizing the, the joy of the season and, and thinking about the time. As the lesson points out, not necessarily the time of Jesus' actual birth, but rather the fact that he came. That's that's what the season is about. And the Catholic Church might have decided Saturnalia was a good time to celebrate the birth of Christ. Well, that's fine. I don't care. Here we are today, and that's why we're here. That's why we're in church, because Jesus was born. Lesson, the unspeakable gift of Christmas. We're embarking on a glorious season that for the Christian should be a time of worship and honor to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. This is not just another birthday of a loved one. It's not even the date of his incarnation. However, it is a time set aside to celebrate the one who took on the fleshly robe of mankind to serve, serve as redemption for humanity's sin. <clears throat> The world we're living in is rapidly changing, and there is a desire among many to disgrace this holy season by not only changing the way that we greet one another in the name of political correctness, but also to make some of the more traditional celebrations seem less spiritual. The simple act of gift giving, seasoned with modesty and thoughtful reflection on the Lord's birth, has been commercialized and demeaned by so many who do not seek to give honor to him. We'll explore some of the gifts given over the 2000 over 2000 years ago and see why we can surely call Christmas time an unspeakable gift. The lesson touched on <coughs> some of the traditions, uh, Christmas traditions. And I, I, I know Brother Rick and I, we've, we've kind of discussed some of those uh, traditions in the past, Nick and I may have as well, uh, thinking about the pagan origins of so many things that we call Christmassy. The uh, holly and the red berries and the mistletoe and the white berries and I'm not going to get into all the, the things that those represent but all of those things uh, point towards pagan deities. That's, that, that's the entire reason that they came and, uh, came and became uh, associated with Christmas in the first place. Once again, going back to Saturnalia and the, and the celebration of the, the pagans of those, or the heathen, and the heathen religions and those things. But we want to focus on Christ. This, this time of year is not about those, but this is about Jesus. In the Golden Truth, first Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Thanks be unto God, for his unspeakable gift. Now, part one to Mary, the gift of the Immaculate Conception. Now, does anybody actually know what the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is about? Anybody? Great my Because uh, uh, Immaculate Conception is conception without the, the it's a Immaculate. There's, there's no sin in it. Here, here's the fun of it. There's no receipt. What, what we think of as the immac Immaculate Conception is not the Immaculate Conception. I just found this out maybe a month ago, maybe two months ago. It was very recent that I found this out. The Immaculate Conception is actually a Catholic doctrine that states that Mary was born without, orig without original sin. Right, yeah. Not that there was no man involved in the birth of Jesus, which is what... I was brought up to believe, and that's, that's what I'd always heard. But that's that's not what the Immaculate Conception yeah, means. I forgot about that. When you talk about that doctrine, yeah, that's a, it's a Catholic thing, talking it's about It's probably Mary. good that you forgot about that part. Yeah, you probably put that out of your mind. <laughs> well, it's been a few years since I've talked about Catholic. Yeah, yeah so. right, right. <laughs> but yeah, that, but what we understand is the Immaculate Conception. Luke 1, 27, 28. 33, 32, and 34, and 35. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, 
the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. In verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he, sh he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. In verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. God gave her a child, not just any child, but the blessed Son from heaven. This was a gift. All mothers and fathers understand that we are blessed to be given children. But do we realize how great a gift Mary surely was given this wonderful child? As the Son of God and as a human being, he would indeed be the Savior of the world. But also, he would be a natural boy and would need to be raised in like manner. He would be able to understand hunger, pain, and growing. And he could indeed even relate to humanity's youngest members since he himself experienced the life of a child. Now, this is something I never, never even thought about till looking at this lesson here. The, the youngest of children, a lot of us looking around here, I know, that many of us were saved when we were young. Whatever happened after that, different stories. But we were most many of us were saved when we were children. And that that is a direct result of the fact that Jesus was a child. He grew and as as a young boy, he experienced childhood. And so he understands. God now understands not only what it is to be human. But to be a child, he understands that innocence from a child's perspective. And so we have that opportunity to come to him in our youth. Part B, the gift of protection and provision. Before I go on, does anybody have any thoughts on that very first section there? Part B, the gift of protection and provision. Matthew 1, 1920. 24 and 25. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her public example, was minded, away to put, minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. In verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. While it is wonderful to be addressed as highly favored and blessed among women, from the mouth of the name angelic messenger from heaven, it's just as devastating to be disgraced among family and peers. This is where we find Mary when she had been overshadowed by the Holy Ghost and had conceived God's only begotten Son. The previous verses of Scripture show Joseph's right to put Mary away and wash his hands of her soiled reputation. In fact, according to the law, he had every right to just take her and have her stone, according to the law. The pre uh, I'm sorry. The previous verses of Scripture show Joseph's right to put Mary away and wash his hands of her soiled reputation. He went to sleep with the intentions of putting her away his betrothed, whom he thought had betrayed him. In a dream during the night, heaven's angels told him that his fears were not warranted and that, the, and that this was in the control of God himself. He then made the choice to accept and protect Mary and provide for her and the unborn child. This was another of the gifts which was given to Mary in honor of the birth of the Christ child. As I, I've been studying on, not necessarily this, but just in my studies in the Bible, it, it came, I came across uh, some thoughts that were very interesting. If he had put her away, she would be disgraced. But by going ahead and marrying her, what was likely to happen is the, the shame that would have been on Mary would have fallen on Joseph. Because it would have been clear, judging from the time of when they were actually married and the time of the betrothal, 
that he was probably the one who had done this if he kept her and he married her. So then he took that shame upon himself as uh, I disgraced my wife before we were actually married, so to speak, in, in the eyes of the, the world around them, the, the, the Jew, according to Jewish law. So he bore her disgrace by going ahead and marrying her. Any thoughts on that section before we move on? I think a lot of times we actually overlook the significance of this whole uh, situation here. Yeah. I mean, we, we we talked about so many times before. We look at it as well; those are Bible people. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're different than me and you. Uh, but to be able to have take take the customs of the time out of the equation, mm -hmm. if it happened today, right. to be able to put out of my manly mind. Mm -hmm. The, the woman who I'm engaged to is now pregnant. Right. And I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> so to be able to overcome that and have the faith that this is God. Right. Uh, we talk about Mary through this process a whole lot more than we do mm -hmm. Joseph. And the Bible talks about Mary a whole lot more than it does Joseph. Right. Really. But uh, Joseph had to have a lot of faith somewhere mm -hmm. along the way to be able to carry on his role in this whole uh, circumstance that happened. Right. Absolutely. And you think about what, you know, their parents really thought. Right. You know, because, you know, you know how parents think and they're probably, you know, upset and what has happened, you know, and this is not normal. And, you know, if he had mentioned, you know, it wasn't me, then everybody would be like, well, then why are you marrying her now, you right. know? I mean, that's how it would happen now. You know, like he was saying, it had to have the faith. You know, Joseph had to have a, the faith and believe the dream that he had. Absolutely. That it was really the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I believe he probably had some kind of experience with the Lord, just like Mary did with Jesus in the womb. You know, he probably had that. You know, and even... Um, oh, I'm trying to think of Mary's cousin right now. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, yeah. when um, John, you know, was filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb, mm -hmm. you know, when met Mary, there was something there, I believe, with Joseph, like, you know, not that he necessarily had the Holy Ghost, but there right. was, but the Spirit was on him, yeah. or he would have totally rejected it. It took God. It absolutely, right. positively took God throughout the situation, working in every individual. And, and, and that's, once again, as Pastor mentioned that's something that we need to take into account in our own lives and the things that we experience and the things that we face. These these were not superhuman these, these were people just like we are. And the trials that they face are the customs may be different, the times may be different, but the trials that we all have in this life are, are the same. Mm -hmm. The pain that we experience when we're hurt is the same. The the disappointment that we experience is the same. The the human nature that we all carry is the same and the need for faith, the need for faith is the same and and it takes uh, and someone uh, just thinking about faith what what it means there's a i heard an account i wish i could tell you who it was that was was talking about it but they were they were trying to explain faith to a a group of people in a foreign country that didn't have the word faith in their vocabulary that the word did not exist and and uh, the, the only way that he was able to bring it across was he he put a chair in front of him and he, and he leaned on it with everything that he had and he said this is faith I know that this chair is going to hold me up and he was leaning on it with, with everything that he had and put all his weight on that chair and that's, that's what it took for them to understand what faith is. Faith isn't simply believing, right. but it's putting everything that we have in God's hands. When, when we recognize that we can't bear the load, we put it on God because, Lord, I can't do this. I know that I can't do this. I can't believe this. I can't understand this. I can't accept this. But I know who you are, and I've seen what you've done, and I know that you can hold me up under any circumstance and in any situation. Also, G, uh, Joseph was a Jew, mm -hmm. and he knew the law. Right. And I think that uh, not only through the dream, that might have given him that initial, okay, 
this is supposed to be of God. We'll see. And then make, just like somebody tells us this is the church of God. Well, but as we search it out and, and look into the scriptures and find scriptures that back up this being the church of God, you know, then, then I think that as he saw like going to Jerusalem for the, you know, for the, uh, um, the, the, for the taxes, you know, it's like, there's another thing in there. Yeah, that, this, and he can see it unfold as things went on. And I believe that helped his faith grow, just like it helps our faith grow in the church as we learn more about the church. Something that just struck me as, as you were talking, just thinking about the situation with Joseph. Joseph never saw Jesus die. Joseph didn't see Jesus in his ministry. He, he was off seeing he, he died before that. So he never got to experience the understanding in this life what, who he was truly raising as his child. He never saw that ministry in this life. Yet he lived by faith and raised that child as if it were his, simply by faith. He, he never received the, the not only the, the pain and the torment of seeing your child die, he didn't experience that. But he also didn't see the ministry. He didn't see those souls who were touched, those lives who were changed, that were changed, those the blind who could see, the lame who could walk, the Aside deaf who the could doctors. hear. The, Aside from the doctors, you got to see a minister when he was twelve. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah. But but to actually see those things in his ministry that he right. performed, that there was nothing. I, I'm sure that was a shock to him at twelve years old teaching the teaching the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and all that, uh, teaching them a thing or two. That's, that's definitely something for a 12-year-old. But he never saw that ministry. And, yeah. and yet, by faith, he just accepted him as his own child. Part two, to the shepherds. Part A, the gift of inclusion. Luke 2, 8 through 12. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. Shepherds were not high-ranking governmental officials, nor were they even appreciated as much as they should have been considering their contribution, contribution to the world and that culture at that time. Their lowly occupation had not placed them very high on the economic or social ladder, but that did not hinder their being given the greatest gift on that blessed day. They were given a special invitation by heaven to visit this tiny king in a manger. The angels were summoned to tell them of Jesus' birth. They made the journey to find this little gift, bundle, in the most unlikely wrapping. Uh, something that, that stands out to me, uh, once again, it's talking about the loneliness of uh, the first people to meet Jesus. Uh, that's, a, that's an indication of who God is looking for. Mm -hmm. He's He's not. Uh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He's not motivated by who we are. He's not motivated by what the world sees in us, but what He sees in us, and His willingness to reach down to the lowest parts of the earth. And looking around, that's that's who we are. <laughs> We're the lowest. Each and every one of us. Not, not one of us is born into a wealthy family. Not to say that there aren't wealthy people who, who get saved. And Jesus said, with God all things are possible. Speaking about the rich man getting into heaven. The majority of us, that's, that's not the case. And God reached first to those who were of no reputation. To those who had nothing that this world would look to and, and see as important. Wonder why they didn't go to the Pharisees and Sadducees and give them the blessing and say, "Come on, boys, I got something to show you." They had a 
rejected him. Yeah. He, knew, he, knew, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, he did. Part B, the gift of worship, Luke 2, 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Not only were the shepherds included in the glorious events of the evening, they were given a glimpse into heaven's worship of Jesus' birth. A host means an army. Some have interpreted it to mean the great army of angels that worship around the very throne of God. These beings came to the first missionaries of the Lord, lowly shepherds on third shift in the field, to herald the birth of Jesus through pure worship. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? Part three, to the wise men. Part A, the gift of understanding. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I'm going to pause here for just a second. Give me one moment. Let me look this verse up. Yep, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. God is no respecter of persons. Just as he called on the shepherds, he also blessed the nobility of the educated and wealthy on the grand occasion of his son's birth. The wise men were watching the sky for signs of very, and of various other things. When Numbers 24 and 17 became a reality to them, I hadn't even looked that up. I thought, sure, it was Balaam's prophecy. And <laughs> sure enough, I'm going to go ahead and read that. Numbers 24, 17. This is Balaam talking to King Balaam. I shall see him. But not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. Well known prophecy of Christ from a pagan. These men were the most educated of their time, they were well versed in science and astronomy. These men were also learned in the scriptures, probably first hearing of them, uh, or first hearing of Israel's promised Messiah from Daniel and the Hebrew children who were in captivity in Babylon. They knew well the prophecies and the words of the Old Testament. They knew that Isaiah 60 and 3 was coming to pass, and they were looking for the promised king. Isaiah 60 and 3. Anybody happen to know that one right off the top of their head? For thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has right. risen upon thee. Isn't that, isn't that it? So we see, and once again, another thing that stands out to me in, in the account, we know, I think we all know, that the wise men weren't there at the manger. They weren't there at the birth. The Bible makes it clear this was around two years later. Bible describes Jesus at this, this point as a child and says that the wise man came to him to the house where he was. So we know that this is not the same place in addition to the fact that this is, he, the king, King Herod asked when his, his uh, advisors when this child was to be born and it was about two years ago from that time. That's why we see that he said, okay, all the, all the baby boys that are two years old and under, kill them. Because he knew that, that that was about the time that this would have taken place. And when, when the star was first seen, according to the wise men, everything. So he was probably about two years old at this time. And the, the reason I said all that, I, I didn't, that wasn't just arbitrary. But the fact is that the first ones to receive the message were the lowest because they were most likely to receive it. Then, and only then, two years later, do we have word uh, arriving all the way in the east. Wherever the east may be, Babylon, uh, in that direction. So we see that yes, the wealthy were also informed of this situation. But it was 
suffers later. And, and how many times in, in our lives do we see that those those who have are, are much slower to receive than those who don't have. Those who, who rely on, they have to have their daily sustenance just to make it. They, they know that they're, they're not going to make it if they don't have, get food today. They are much more quick. Their, their, their turn to the Lord is speedy because they, they understand. Trust in the Lord and he'll supply your daily bread. They understand daily bread. We don't even understand daily bread. My guess is if something happened and all the all the stores in Cleveland shut down, there's not a not one of us who go hungry this month. Now we may not get to eat everything we wanted to, but chances are good there's plenty of food in our houses that we could eat for quite some time and not go hungry. And so I mean, we don't even know what daily bread is. But those who have, they don't know how to trust in anything but what they have because. They always have had. So we, we need to understand that God is willing to reach anyone, anywhere, even though some may take longer than others to receive it. Thoughts, comments, before I move on to this next part. Is it saying how many? It never says how many. It says three gifts, but it doesn't say how many. It just says wise men from the east. A caravan. So... Might have been thirty. Might have been two. Might have been. Well, it, it was at least at least two. It was certainly at least two because it was described as wise men. So, but it, it could have been a hundred. We don't know. There's there's no way. The, the scriptures don't make it clear how many there were, except there were more than one. Because it's always just assume three because three gifts. People assume three because of three gifts, but the Bible doesn't say anywhere anywhere at all anything about the number beyond. I wouldn't want to be number four showing up without a gift, so <laughs> <laughs> and it's possible I don't think he could be considered a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's possible that they all could have and there could have been thirty of them and they all brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Or it could have been that some of them brought sure. gold and frankincense, and some of them brought gold and myrrh, and some of them brought frankincense and myrrh, and some so I, there, it doesn't describe anything right. beyond the, the three gift and three gifts and the fact that there were more than one because they were wise men. <clears throat> B gifts from the, the wise men. Matthew two and eleven. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now here's another thought. It, it, it's not real clear, but it's, it's a thought. And when they were coming to the house, it, it probably wasn't 30 now that I'm thinking about it, just looking at this, because you'd have had a hard time getting 30 into a house at that time. Most of the time, a house is, I mean, just a room. Yeah. <laughs> oven on one side, a lamp. I mean, there wasn't, wasn't lots of furniture or knickknacks or anything, but right. pretty much just a place to sleep and get away from the sun. So it's probably fewer than 30. But anyway, the wise men did not come empty-handed. The gifts they brought to honor the Messiah were valuable and well thought out. Let us look at each gift individually. One, gold. It was customary at the birth of a prince to show respect for him by making him presents or offerings of this kind. This custom is still common in the East, and it is unusual to, pro to approach a per person of distinguished rank without a valuable present. Two, frankincense. This was a product of Arabia. It was a white resin or gum, tree sap, and it was obtained, by, obtained from a tree by making cuts deep in the bark causing the gum to flow out. It was highly fragrant when burned and was therefore used in worship where it was burned as a pleasant offering to God. Three, myrrh. This was also a product of Arabia and was obtained from a tree in the same manner as a frankincense. The name denotes bitterness and was given to it on this account. Uh, myrrh, of course, is Aramaic or Greek, I'm not sure, but it would have come from the Hebrew Mara. And, and immediately, as soon as I think of Mara, I think of the story of Naomi, 
when she came back from Moab with her daughter-in-law on by her side, they said, oh, it's Naomi. And they said, oh, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Naomi means pleasant. And so they were calling her. They basically, oh, here comes pleasant. And she said, no, it's not pleasant. It's bitter. It's bitter. It's very bitter. She just lost her, her husband and her two sons and was coming back to beg for her land in, in her country after coming back from Moab. So this was a bitter time in her life. And that's why she called herself, said, call me Mara. And Mara, Mer, same root. It was used chiefly in embalming, in embalming the dead because it had been had the property of preserving them from putrefaction. It was obtained from a thorny tree which grows eight or nine feet high. It was an ingredient of the holy anointment, ointment. It was also a good smelling perfume of the time. Adam Clark says, these gifts were emblematic of the divinity, regal office, and manhood of Christ. They offered him incense as their go incense as their god, gold as their king, and myrrh as united to a human body subject to suffering and death. Once again, as I think of these things uh, and the way both of these aromatic resins were gotten as uh, these Honestly, deep cuts made in the bark of the tree and uh, just Reminiscent to me of the deep cuts that were made in Jesus and his uh, in his death prior to his death and the thorns on his head bringing forth that not so aromatic blood that it was sweet and that it bought our salvation. Isaiah 30, 53, 3 through 5 was no doubt a passage which with which they would have been familiar and murder would have been symbolic of that need to be comforted. I do want to read Isaiah 53, 3-5 here. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Once again, thinking about those stripes. The, the smell of these aromatic resins when burned was, was a very beautiful thing. And so it is. We... We think about the broken body of Christ and that's not a beautiful thing. But we think about what it bought. It bought, it paid our ransom. We all were sold as captives to the enemy of our souls and freely submitted to him as our captor. But by those stripes, we have the sweet smell of salvation that we can experience in our lives. Therefore, the wise men brought unto, unto this Christ child and his family three gifts, none of which, none of which matched the unspeakable gift which he would be to us. Any thoughts there before I move on to conclusion? Conclusion, this year, when we exercise our Christmas traditions of passing out presents to other rem others, remember where this idea came from and understand that there was no greater gift given to humanity than the gift of our Savior. This gift has no expiration and requires no assembly or batteries. It cannot be returned or exchanged. It is the great, grandest and most unspeakable gift. Who having not seen, you love. And whom though now we see him, ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 1 Peter 1 and 8. This season, may we be able to share with those who so desperately need a gift that is priceless and most needful. 
Share the joy of this blessed time by showing others and reminding others of the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Any comments? Mr. Comments.